Southwestern Sydney accounted for 84 of yesterday's 112 cases, with the majority in the Fairfield local government area. It comes as one new case has been detected in Goulburn, in, that's a couple of hours southwest of Sydney. Victoria has recorded one new COVID case, a member of the same household as the two cases identified yesterday who'd been in isolation. The family had returned to Melbourne from New South Wales on red zone permits. The infections have forced residents of an apartment building in Maribyrnong in Melbourne's northwest into quarantine for 14 days. The federal and New South Wales governments have finalised a new relief package for people and businesses hit by the Greater Sydney lockdown with the details to be announced later today. The emergency support payment for people unable to work will be raised and businesses will also be able to access a cash flow boost to help meet overheads. And thousands of Cubans have taken part in the biggest protests in decades against the country's communist government. Demonstrators have been angered by the collapse of the economy food and medicine shortages, price hikes and the government's handling of the pandemic. There have been calls for President Miguel Diaz-Canel to step down while he blames the US and its long-running trade embargo for the protests. New South Wales is struggling to contain its COVID outbreak with the majority of cases coming from Sydney's southwest. There's a growing number of exposure sites in the area where people have been while infectious. Frank Carboni is the Mayor of Fairfield Council and says most people in the community are doing the right thing to drive down cases. It just shows how infectious the Delta strain is compared to the previous strain. It's something that we're all going to have to deal with. Uh, we are concerned about it, of course, but I know that the community has a strong spirit uh, and I know that the communities will rise to the occasion. Everyone is staying at home. We've received positive reports from the police that 99.9% uh, .9 of people are doing the right thing, which is really important. And uh, I just urge the community to keep on doing what we're doing and that is stay home, wear masks and, uh, of course, look after our loved ones. I'm sure you're keeping an eye across these exposure sites which are listed by New South Wales Health every kind of 12 hours or so. Overnight, uh, they showed two Fairfield businesses where there was possible exposure for the whole of last week. One was in, in Allen Street, one in Spencer Street, Fairfield, which I'm sure you're familiar with. Are you expecting these numbers are going to grow substantially more from where they're at now? Well, we do have large families in Fairfield, so the serious lockdown started on Friday and where there was one infection, uh, of course, uh, mixing in with the family members and staying at home, uh, we're expecting those infections to grow amongst the families themselves. Um, also, there are a lot of essential workers that come in and out of Fairfoot every day, more than 10,000 of them. That's what the, uh, the state government has legislated. The essential workers are still open. Some of those businesses you talked about, there are actually medical centres, uh, so people go in there for help and um, so it's obviously really difficult to contain with Delta strain and we've seen that overnight with Bondi but also we've seen the removalist uh, where the, um, the, the, the actual the, the virus has managed to spread to Victoria and South Australia. It doesn't take long with the Delta virus but we're all in this together no matter where people live. Uh, of course Fairfoot's the hotspot and we need as much help as we can uh, but I think I just want to urge people across all of Sydney and New South Wales to really take care and abide by the, by the health orders. Yeah, you mentioned we need as much help as we can. What do you make of the help you are receiving so far? What is that? And what's the testing set up like in Fairfield? Yeah, so we, we have, uh, we've got a lot more testing centres now. We've got about seven or eight testing centres. Our drive through centre at the showgrounds doing really well. Just that one centre had 3,000 tests. Mm -hmm. Yesterday, we were really pleased at the amount of people turning up and there's been extra resources uh, obviously allocated to that. So we're really pleased about that. Um, look, at the end of the day, the community needs to uh, knuckle down, we need to isolate, stay home and we need to do the things that we know that work um, because uh, this strain can easily pop up anywhere and it can spread really fast. Mm. So we, the, uh, the only thing with the resources is, of course, at the Fairfield Showground, we did want a vaccination hub. We believe that uh, being a hotspot, we, we need to get that Pfizer vaccine uh, allocated to residents as quick as possible and that is because the Pfizer vaccine can be used within three weeks as opposed to the AstraZeneca vaccine that takes three months. Uh, what we do need to do is stop the spread no matter where it is and at, the, at this moment FEF was doing it tough and I think that given that there's been a, a, an extra allocation coming in from next week up, up to a million doses, I don't think anyone will begrudge Fairfield residents getting uh, a bit of extra uh, Pfizer vaccine. After all, we're all in this together. If we can control it here in Fairfield, we can control it spreading anywhere else. 
And uh, Frank, do you know anyone in Fairfield who's positive yourself? And uh, what are you hearing about the support that's been offered for people who are um, positive, COVID positive? Yeah, I'm not. I'm not aware aware personally of everyone. Council, uh, obviously, we don't, we don't know. We don't know who it is. That, that that information is private. But no doubt, they're doing it tough. And uh, if they are watching, I just want everyone to know that we're here to support them. Uh, it is a tough time, but you know we're a resilient community out here. Uh, no doubt, it would be tough. You can imagine if you're if you're in Fairfield at the moment, how difficult it can be. But again, I, I just want to alert everybody: this Delta strain. Uh, really takes takes hold very easily. And once it spreads, it's hard to control. Frank Carboni there in Sydney, the Fairfield Mayor. Fairfield being the epicentre, basically, of this COVID outbreak. Now we're expecting that key media conference from Gladys Berejiklian in about 25 minutes' time. Western Australia has tightened the rules around compassionate grounds for travellers from New South Wales. The state government, WA Police and WA Health, are strongly discouraging any West Australian from travelling to New South Wales because of the worsening situation. The exemption category also doesn't guarantee a right of entry to WA even if they're a returning resident. The federal and New South Wales governments will today announce a new support package for people and businesses hit by the lockdown in Greater Sydney. Political reporter Jane Norman has more from Canberra. Well, not a lot of detail released so far, but what we're expecting is this financial package to have two elements. The first is more support for businesses that have been crippled by this lockdown in Greater Sydney. Now, the support we're expecting will come via where either a direct payment or tax credits. We don't know at this stage, but they'll come. it'll come with one big condition, <coughs> and that is any companies that are assisted by this uh, support package must retain their staff. They must keep the workers on. It's all about keeping jobs. Uh, as, and apart from that, we're also expecting a boost to the COVID disaster payment that was only introduced about six weeks ago during Melbourne's last lockdown. Uh, today, we understand the government is likely to increase it to up to about $600 a week. And uh, it's also expected that the eligibility will be expanded so that more workers can access this payment. So we're seeing income support boost and also a boost to businesses. Interestingly, Joe, it was only last week when National Cabinet decided that that during lockdowns, the feds would take care of income support while the states would look after business support. Well, this package today, we understand, is expected to be uh, co-funded by the New South Wales and Commonwealth governments. So a, a change, really, to that approach, um, underscoring, I guess, the, the seriousness of the situation in Sydney. And Jane, the Vaccine Advisory Group met last night to consider safety advice for the AstraZeneca shot. We touched on this a little earlier with reporter Lara Hyams. Uh, just take us through the result of that meeting. Yeah, well, no change, according to ATAGI, which is the expert advisory group. So that means Pfizer remains the preferred vaccine for under 60s and AstraZeneca for over 60s. And that is despite the worsening situation uh, in Sydney. Now, the, the reason why AstraZeneca is being limited to the older age group is because of the risk of a very rare blood clotting disorder linked to the vaccine. The younger you are, the higher, the very small risk of contracting it. So that is the medical advice. But what we're seeing now is uh, a shift in the advice from the governments. So both the Commonwealth Government and New South Wales Government have made it very clear that anyone who wants AstraZeneca, even if you're under 60, should go and talk to your GP about getting it. That is because, firstly, the risks are changing in Sydney. There is community transmission of COVID. Secondly, there are plentiful supplies of AstraZeneca. So it's interesting to see that sort of shift emerge now because when ATAGI originally made its advice or handed down its advice, it was based on the fact that there was no COVID in the community. So for some people it meant that your risk of getting this blood uh, disorder, this clotting disorder, was higher than getting COVID. Well, as I mentioned, that risk is shifting in Sydney. So we have seen the safety advice change through this pandemic and it could be the case, Joe, that it changes again. And Jane, there'll be a bit of anticipation about that government announcement on increased financial support later today. Any idea on the timing of that or is it like, is, presumably uh, some of it is going to be mentioned in that uh, New South Wales media conference? Yeah, we're expecting it'll be, we think at this stage, a joint press conference with the Prime Minister and New South Wales Premier and early afternoon is all we're being told at this stage. So we'll bring you any updates as we get them. At least 39 people have died in a fire at a hospital in Iraq. It broke out in the southern city of Nasiriyah and is believed to have started in the hospital's COVID ward when an oxygen tank exploded. Authorities say many people were trapped by the flames and the death toll could rise. 
At least two healthcare workers are believed to be among the dead. In April, a fire caused by an oxygen tank explosion at a hospital in Baghdad claimed 82 lives while 110 people were injured. Lightning strikes have, during severe storms have killed at least 50 people in northern India. The majority of the deaths occurred in the state of Rajasthan. In one incident, 11 people died when they were caught in a storm near the watchtower of an ancient fort. Most of the victims were hit while working in fields. Thousands of people have taken the streets in Cuba's largest demonstrations for more than a quarter of a century. Public protests on this scale are rare in the communist-controlled state and reflect growing anger over hunger, high prices and the government's handling of the pandemic. US President Joe Biden has called on the Cuban regime to listen to the people, but the Cuban government maintains US sanctions are to blame. <laughs> Libertad, the crowd in Havana shouts, or freedom. But while many Cubans feel this in their hearts, it's extremely rare for protesters to take to the streets to give vent to their anger in this one-party communist state. We are here because of the repression against the people. They are starving us to death. Havana is collapsing. We have no house, we have nothing. But they have the money to build hotels and they have us starving. And shouting, down with the dictatorship, as many of the protesters did, can come with a heavy price. But a toxic cocktail of economic collapse, a faltering response to the pandemic and lack of civil liberties has emboldened these people. And the response of the president, blame your over-mighty neighbour just 90 miles to the north, the United States. There will be a revolutionary response. So we call upon all the revolutionaries in the country, all the communists, to take to the streets of any of the places where these provocations are going to take place. For decades, Cuba was a flashpoint in the Cold War between the US and the Soviet Union. The familiar communist brainwashing technique is displayed in propaganda books, constantly spewed out as required reading. Nearly sparking a nuclear confrontation between the superpowers. In this period, hundreds of thousands Thousands of Cubans fled to the US and to Miami. And it was no surprise that last night the exiled community was out in force to support their countrymen. Support that's come from the American president too. I don't think we've seen anything like this protest uh, in a long, long time, if, if quite frankly ever. Um, and the United States stands firmly with the people of Cuba as they assert their universal rights. and. We call on the government, government of Cuba, to refrain from violence or attempts to silence the voice of the people of Cuba. This is being watched incredibly closely by the White House. Sanctions that were intensified in the Trump era have not been relaxed by Joe Biden. What needs to be weighed is whether this is just a spasmodic outburst or the start of a Cuban spring and something much more fundamental. Now here's David Chow with a look at business news. The pandemic hasn't just hit the pay packets of ordinary workers. One third of the CEOs of Australia's largest 100 listed companies did not get a bonus last year. That's the biggest hit to executive pay in more than a decade. The CEOs of Qantas, Woolworths, Flight Centre and AMP were among those who lost out on bonuses, according to analysis from the Australian Council of Superannuation Investors. Of those who did get paid a short-term incentive, it fell on average to just 30% of the maximum allowed. Australia's highest paid boss was Paul Perrow from CSL, which is manufacturing the AstraZeneca vaccine, and was trialling the failed University of Queensland vaccine. He took home $43 million all up. Now, the ACCC has launched court action against the invisible braces company Smile Direct Club. The regulator is accusing Smile Direct of misleading consumers about whether their private health insurance would likely cover their aligners. 26,000 people ordered the company's invisible braces during the period uh, that the campaign ran between mid-2019 and late 2020. Most Australian private health insurers do not cover Smile Direct's product, despite the company insisting customers were able to claim reimbursement for the treatment. 
Now, the Australian share market is off to a very solid start. Clearly, Sydney's extended lockdown is not on the minds of investors. They're betting this will be just a short-term pickup, especially with all that stimulus and low interest rates propping up the market. Instead, the ASX is following a strong lead from Wall Street, which closed at record highs. So the All Lords and ASX 200 are up about 0.6%, building on yesterday's strong performance. And every sector is trading higher, with banks and miners doing the heavy lifting. Today's best performing stock is Nearmap, a company which does high resolution aerial maps, up 15%. It basically told investors that it's expecting to earn more money this year than it previously forecast. Also doing well are Incitec Pivot, which makes fertilizer and explosives, and lithium producer Orocobre. On the flip side, Whitehaven Coal, Crown Resorts, and Platinum Asset Management are experiencing heavy falls. Now, overnight on US markets, the Dow, S&P and Nasdaq all went up slightly by about a quarter to a third of a percent each. And all three indexes closed at their highest levels ever once again. Investors are optimistic that the US reporting season, which kicks off this week, will be a strong one. Now, gold prices are pretty steady at 1,807 US dollars an ounce. Oil prices are a bit mixed with uh, West, Tech, uh, West, Tex West Texas crude at 74.2 US dollars a barrel. And the Australian dollar has continued to recover some of its recent losses. It's risen back to about 74.85 US cents. Thanks, David. A Gold Coast teenager is causing a stir in the global dance community, inventing a new style dubbed the East Coast Boogie. The lively style combines the rock and roll six-step, the European Boogie Woogie and modern dance. Raiden Hiata is the Boogie Woogie Bugle Boy behind the new dance and he joins us now from the Gold Coast. Raiden, g'day, this is so cool that you've created this. Tell us how you got into dance in the first place. Um, so firstly, um, my parents rock and roll world champion. And um, recently, yeah, around, um, they sort of got me to record their videos that they got back into it. And then as time went on, I sort of just asked them, um, oh, could you teach me the step? And then I guess from there, it's what I progressed my step from there. And then, yeah, that's where it all started was late last year. And so, yeah, so how did you get the inspiration to create your own style? Um, to be honest, I didn't really have much inspiration when creating, like, my own style. Um, it sort of just happened, like, as I watched more videos on YouTube about um, dancing and, like, with the partnership and everything, um, I actually didn't realise I created my own step until my parents mentioned it to me and my partner um, one time when we were training. And then, yeah, so from there, I, I actually didn't know I created my own style. Yeah, we're just seeing some shots of you. It look, looks like you're performing in a kind of a basketball hall or something like that on some timber in, in a suit and looking very sharp. For, for those of us who don't dan dance much, explain for us what the new dance is and how it melds several styles. Um, so it's just a combination of New Zealand rock and roll, which is my parents' step that I originally um, learned. And then once I saw the Boogie Woogie step online on YouTube, I started to pick that up. And then um, I kind of just put it all together. And then, it, yeah, it's just kind of new, fresh, something um, different for our younger generation. And, yeah. And when did you first put it on show? Um, so... When I first, uh, me and my partner, we um, had a couple of trainings together for a competition. And then once we um, competed in that competition, Dad um, started to upload some videos of us, which um, currently went viral. And then I guess it just took off from there. Yeah. And was there a bit of blowback initially because you were breaking the dance rules like in a movie or something? Or did they love it straight off? <laughs> Um, well, yeah, we didn't get placed in that competition, I guess, because it was just something different compared to um, traditional rock and roll. And that's sort of um, how their competitions go. Like, everything's kind of restricted. Yeah. Um, and regulations where um, our style, when we competed, was just very loose and freestyle, pretty much. You're a bit of a dance revolutionary. <laughs> yeah, I guess. <laughs> yeah. And so you've had a couple of people contact you from overseas, pretty interested in it? Yeah, um, so they're actually um, competitors in the boogie woogie scene. Um, so it was good to um, make contact, like new contacts with people overseas. Um, so yeah, that was like a really cool opportunity just to speak with some of those um, high competitors and yeah. Yeah, so where to from here with it? 
Um, to be honest, we don't really know. Um, right now, we're just filling it out a bit, um, trying to create new stuff. Um, but we are definitely looking to um, uh, travel overseas, maybe, if this COVID stuff um, gets better during the future. Um, but, yeah. Yeah, well, good on you for uh, creating something brand new and looking forward to seeing you in a kind of strictly ballroom movie someday. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, Raiden Hiata there and uh, creative young guy from the Gold Coast. Yes, thank you. And now to a man with some smooth moves of his own. Tony Armstrong joins us with a look at the day's sport. <laughs> it's so smooth, in fact, that I think he's had a wardrobe change since breakfast. I don't know what's behind that. But before we get on to the sport, Tony, uh, I've got to say, when we were talking last week about Ash Barty going into Wimbledon and you, you said, yeah, the stars are aligning, and I was thinking, oh, God, I hope he doesn't put the mockers on it. I think we can say from now on, if you start saying stuff like that, it's OK, because you've said it once and Ash Barty came through with the goods. Wasn't it amazing, Joe? Uh, she just... Uh, the amount of pressure that was on her, you know, um, so much of the nation's expectation, I obviously didn't help saying the stuff I was saying. <laughs> and the way that she carried herself um, to, to win Wimbledon, and, yeah, like we said, so many different things aligning in terms of, uh, like, 50 years since um, Yvonne Goulagong won it, 10 years since she won it as a junior. NAIDOC week, I was just like, if it was ever going to happen, it was going to be this week, and uh, she did it. So I was um, one, of the, one of the more happy people getting around on uh, Saturday evening, Joe, absolutely. And so it sounds like you've got a bit of a strained voice today from jumping around with the Italians yesterday, but we've got to, <laughs> we've got to get on with today's sport. So we better get on to this uh, Aussie Rules game. So the, uh, yeah, North got up. Up, uh, over West Coast Eagles and, and North are on the bottom of the table. Yeah, so North are uh, yeah, uh, on, on the bottom of the table uh, and they stunned West Coast. Uh, and the Eagles, they're really struggling for form themselves. That's their third straight loss. And that's put their spot in the eight up or in, in a fair bit of jeopardy. Um, yeah, the Kangas, as you said, Joe, last place. But they showed a lot of composure. This is Liam Ryan, just such a beautiful finish. He's kicked that from about 55 out. Oh, and he, wow. and I, just, I just love that footage. That's some of the new footage uh, that they're using. And it really takes you in nice and close to, I you guess, the game it makes angle. you feel like you it makes you feel like you're there but yeah it was a 10 point win by the kangaroos uh 70 to 60 points in the end this is Jaden stevenson here he had an absolute night that was late in the game um uh, a lot of a lot of pressure on that kick he had 38 touches and and that and that was that goal there nick larkey another player for for the ruse who kicked three goals to to lead the goal scorers for the evening but yeah the kangaroos they remain on uh, in bottom spot on the ladder while the eagles their last win came against the tigers who aren't flying either a month ago but if you were to look Look at a snapshot of both of those sides' form lines. Uh, the Kangaroos in the last five weeks have actually had better form than the Eagles in the last five weeks. So um, worrying signs for West Coast with the finals not too far away. OK, now in rugby league, uh, the Warriors have had a really tough time of it because they're obviously based in New Zealand. What's the latest on what's happening with them? So, yeah, two, they've basically spent two seasons away from home and they've been denied their homecoming, unfortunately, due, due to the escalating COVID-19 outbreak in Sydney, Joe. They, they, they had to relocate last year to Tamworth to allow the NRL season to resume in round three. And that happened all the way um, in last May last year. And, and then can you just, I just want to tell you, can you explain that celebration of the Cronulla players where one <laughs> yeah. hits the other? It looks like it's Yeah, he was, um, he, was, he, he was doing a rock bottom. You know, you know, you know the rock in... in uh, oh, well, yeah, he's yeah. a famous action star. He was originally a um, WWE wrestler. Um, and that was his that was his famous move, uh, the rock it's bottom. It's a pretty impressive uh, move. <laughs> um, and uh, and uh, they've played all 17 well uh, rounds of 2021 based in New South Wales. So they've just had an absolute shocker. And then they got the announcement um, that they were going to get a home game in round 22 back in Auckland. Not to be with the COVID outbreak um, that's going to be played here in Australia. They haven't said exactly where 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 it will be, but it's obviously not going to be back in New Zealand. I, my heart bleeds for for those guys who have been so far away from home for so long just to keep the competition going. Yeah. And, yeah, how ugly was this stuff after the Euro final? 
Oh, it's disgusting. I really loved what Harry Kane said um, uh, after after the match. He just basically said the the abuse of Marcus Rash, Rashford, Bukayo Saka, and uh, Jaden Sancho. It, it was just you're not an England fan, and we don't want you as a fan um, if you're going to be saying those kind of things. And it was just disgusting seeing it happen. I was I was actually down watching the game, and my first thought when when the three players missed the penalties was they. They're going to be absolutely smoked on, on our social media. And that's exactly what uh, happens. Disgusting seeing that, Joe. And I hate talking about it, but yeah. we have to more you than call, we want call to. Call it out. Okay, cheers, Tony. Time now to check out the weather. Here is Nate Byrne. I've got some new information from the Bureau for you. It's all about this front that's ploughed through the west. We've still got some warnings on in WA's southwest corner for damaging winds, damaging surf that could lead to some coastal erosion and abnormally high tides. We're looking at gusts potentially getting to 100 kilometres an hour. Now that is easing today as this front marches eastwards and the front is washing out but it's going to move into the southeast tomorrow and the Bureau's put out warnings now for some damaging winds along the northeast ranges in Victoria, potentially gusting to 100 kilometres now and then through New South Wales south through the Alps we could be seeing gusts getting to 125 kilometres an hour so we'll keep a close eye out for that. None of this getting into Queensland today we've got a couple of showers for the east coast mostly the Cassowary coast but that's pretty much it it's fine everywhere else including in Brisbane where it's getting to 21 and in New South Wales we'll see some falls continuing for the central and southern ranges in the state and also some snow across the Alps ahead of that really windy morning tomorrow morning. Falls for the southwest later as that front moves in it's dry for the capitals, though, getting to 20 in Sydney, 13 in Canberra. And Victoria already has some wet weather through much of the state. Isolated falls, though the southwest will see a bit more, and through the central and eastern ranges, where we're looking at those warnings as well for tomorrow. It's a dry day in Melbourne, though, getting to 15. Tassie, you've got wet weather through the north, the west and the far south, but it's fine everywhere else, including Hobart, with a top of 13. And South Australia is copping some wet weather out of this front, too, for much of the state. It's getting to 16 in Adelaide. You've got showers increasing. WA is certainly still wet through the southwest, and We'll see storms uh, from Durian Bay around to Esperance. That includes Perth, 19 the top. Up north, Joe, maybe some showers for the southwest of the Territory and a couple of drops for the northeast of the top end. That's it. Darwin's got a sunny 33. Thanks, mate. Stick with us on the ABC News Channel. Going for a short break now. We'll be back soon. New South Wales Premier Gladys Berejiklian will step up in the next few minutes for the major COVID update for the day.